33-year-old male, unremarkable medical history, married to 31-year-old female, lost two pregnancies, six weeks, eight weeks, products of conception, with both tested to be normal, female workup for recurrent pregnancy loss, whichever that is that you follow, is normal, his semen analysis is normal. Infertile male, <laughs> semen analysis normal. 2.5 cc's, concentration 45 million sperm per cc, motility 60%, morphology 3%. No, I said normal, but yeah, 3%. So, role of male factor testing in recurrent pregnancy loss, I think we could, this is one indication where you should probably discuss DNA fragmentation. We'll talk about how to do DNA fragmentation, how to improve sperm DNA fragmentation, and what are some of the ways in which we can bypass sperm DNA fragmentation. So, what is sperm DNA fragmentation? So, yesterday someone asked, we were not there, where does sperm DNA fragmentation take place? I think most likely it happens in the epididymis, not in the testis, in the epididymis. Blood testis barrier, testis, testicular sperm are sort of immune to all of the toxicants that can affect sperm, such as increased BMI, poor diet, stress, smoking, varicocele, drugs, caffeine, pollution, toxins, cancer, aging. Okay, all of which can cause sperm DNA fragmentation, and I think DNA fragmentation most likely happens when the sperm transits the epididymis. What are some of the ways in which we can assess DNA fragmentation? Tunnel, comet, SESA are probably the most frequently used tests. The important thing for you to remember is you know which test you are using and whether the laboratory gives you reliable values. Just like semen analysis, DNA fragmentation can vary from patient to patient, from lab to lab, from technician to technician, okay? So just remember that it's very variable and just because you've got one abnormal sperm DNA fragmentation doesn't mean he's always going to be abnormal, right? There could be normal, abnormal, just like semen analysis. So what is the relevance of sperm DNA fragmentation? So we'll go over sperm DNA peculiarity, like it's weird, um, etiology, why does sperm DNA fragmentation happen, what are some of the test methods that we can do, and what are some of the influence of laboratory techniques, and finally we'll finish off with how does it affect some of the fertility treatments that we are doing. So why is sperm DNA very peculiar? It occupies such a small space within the entire sperm. This is a sperm head, and this is the nucleus and nucleus is both protamin and histone rich, both of which are responsible for compacting all of that sperm DNA into such a small space. When you look at the egg, which is so big, and the sperm that is so small, and within the sperm, the head is so small, and within that head, the DNA is so small. If you think that just that one piece of DNA alone is enough to make the fertilization for the whole egg, you imagine how such a small piece of DNA could influence such a big egg and make fertilization, right? So that, all of that is compacted very well with sperm, uh, with the use of histones and protamines, both of which, if they are affected, can cause sperm DNA breaks, right? If that's the long piece of DNA, you just break it. Okay? That's DNA fragmentation, sperm DNA fragmentation. So mature sperm, about 85% is protamin bound, 15% are histone bound, right? Both of them are important for making the sperm DNA very compact and they're bound by both protamins and histones. And if you have protamin deficiency, now you're susceptible to more damage from reactive oxygen species. And in fertile men, association studies have shown that there is a higher histone to protamin ratio than in fertile men. So mostly is protamin, few is histones, and if you have the reverse, then you can have higher DNA fragmentation. So during spermiogenesis, so most of sperm maturation happens in the epididymis, right? Not in the testis. Testicular sperm are mostly immature. They mature as they reach the epididymis and as they transit through the epididymis. And so as they got transit through the epididymis and make spermiogenesis, that's where most of the uh, DNA damage happens. So what are some of the etiologies of DNA damage? I think we went through this. So this is basically testicular sperm here showing around Sertoli cell as they go from spermatogonia into mature sperm. But then when they transit through the epididymis and they transit through the vas deferens, this is where most of the DNA fragmentation happens. And one of the causes for DNA fragmentation is reactive oxygen species, right? Antioxidants, reactive oxygen species, DNA fragmentation causing impaired fertility. Yes, people make connection. Testicular sperm, more pure. Epididymal sperm, not as pure, right? All of the toxins get exposed, affects epididymal sperm, affects epididymal sperm maturation, and so therefore causes DNA fragmentation. So what happens to uh, DNA damage? It's, it can apoptosis. So higher sperm DNA fragmentation can lead to poor sperm viability and remodeling of the chromatin. So if the 
chromatin is not packed well, right? Histamine, histone and protamines are important for packing the sperm DNA. If it doesn't get packed well, if it's a little loose, then it cannot fertilize as well. So most likely, so some of the causes for this, varicocele, genital tract infection, radiation, chemotherapy, obesity, cell phones, people are talking about smoking, all of these exposures which technology was not available in, you know, 25, 30 years ago, sperm DNA was probably not as fragmented as it is now. Some of the reasons why a very large study actually that came out of Europe showing that sperm counts are actually declining from 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know, are all, is this is how evolution is going to end? <laughs> I don't think so. But still, we just have to remember that this is where all of these exposures come into play. So when a guy comes and says, I'm smoking and I'm talking on my cell phone all the time and I keep my cell phone and my laptop on, is there any damage? We don't know the answer to that, right? I don't know. Not all smoking guys are infertile, right? Just the same concept. Not all smokers get lung cancer. Same concept. But we do know that men who have uh, exposures to smoking, la long prolonged laptop use, and so on, can have increased uh, sperm DNA fragmentation and can affect fertility <laughs> outcomes, therefore. Unfortunately, most of the studies that we have in this association studies, right? There's no causative studies, but mostly association studies. So if we have reactive oxygen species, we need to have a good scavenging system. And so therefore, in men with infertility, there seems to be an increased level of reactive oxygen species that can happen. So if the reactive oxygen species can fluctuate, then antioxidant defense mechanisms cannot exist. But the most important thing that I want to stress over here is that just like how sperm concentration can vary in 36 samples. So this was 36 samples provided by a single donor over a period of 21 months. So x-axis here, 21 months, y-axis here, sperm concentration. Single guy, right? Just one, same, same semen sample, just assessed on different days. You see how much variability that is in concentration, how much variability that is in motility, same exact thing, variability in ROS, and therefore variability in DNA fragmentation, right? So anytime you're looking at one piece of laboratory information, just you, you just don't know if you caught him on a bad day or you caught him on a good day, right? Single sample, look at how much variability, single patient, not single sample, sorry. There's so much variability in sperm concentration, motility, as well as in ROS. So what tests do we have to use, doctor? I want to do sperm DNA fragmentation when I go home. What tests can I use? So the direct assays, and there are indirect assays. Direct assays, they look at sperm DNA directly. Whatever sample you give them, they look at directly. Most commonly used are at least tunnel assay and the comet assay. Indirect assays, you actually need to denature the entire DNA and then assess. Most commonly used is the sperm chromatin structure assay, SESA. It's commercialized, it's available as a kit form. Uh, and so therefore, if you use the kit, which is expensive, it can uh, give you reliable results because it's been standardized for infertile and fertile men. Comet assays at neutral pH and tunnel, these are some things that you need to standardize in your lab or your lab must have standardized this on their own. They should have gotten 25, 30 fertile men. They should have made a nice bell curve. Again, another 25, 30 infertile men should have made another bell curve, come up with normal values, right? And then use them if they haven't. One of the first things that I did when this guy came and said, oh, I want to do sperm DNA, is I sent him fertile patients, right? And I know there were fertile controls got back numbers, reliably tested, knowing that these DNA fragmentations were normal before I started sending patients. So very difficult to do. It's worse than semen analysis. It's, not every lab can do this. So whenever you're sending sperm DNA fragmentation, make sure that they're doing something reliable and not just giving you some random percentages off the hat. So what is a tunnel assay? So this is a direct assay. It measures DNA fragmentation. So this is if this DNA is fragmented, you fix, you, you permeate these cells and then you wash it and you finally attach a dye and if there is a DNA breakage, this dye will come and bind and then you stain the nucleus and image it. So this is a semen sample on panel A, semen sample on panel B. If the dye is attached, then you basically know how much DNA are fragmented. So you basically count the number of sperm here and then you count the number of sperm here, basically with the number of green dots and come up with a percentage, right? Of the 100 sperm here, about 12 sperm are fragmented because now they have the dye attached to it, so therefore the DNA fragmentation in this sperm sample is 12%. Yes. Again, you understand that if you look at an entirely different slide, right, within the same slide, if you look at a different area, you're going to get a different number. Remember, this is variable, just like semen analysis. SESA, it's an indirect way, so you have to denature the DNA and then follow it and stain it with acrid and orange. 
That's why it's orange and measures the metachromatic stuff. If it's green in color, that means it's the native DNA and it did not get denatured. If it's red in color like this, then it did get denatured and then the fluorophore bound. So basically that again, same concept. You count a total of 100 sperm, count the number of sperm that are green, count the number of sperm that are red. Red over green plus red equals percentage gets you a percentage of sperm DNA fragmentation. So, comparison of sperm chromatin assays between infertile men and fertile men. This is at least the SCSA and the tunnel assay. In fertile men, the percentage was about 22%. In sperm donors, it's 11%. Important to know that even in fertile men, sperm DNA will be fragmented. Right? This is a common process. This is a physiologic process. Sperm, sperm DNA will get fragmented. So don't think that guys who are fertile will have 0% or 5% or 1%. Oh my gosh, your number is 15%. No wonder you're not getting pregnant, right? Do not use numbers like these in absolute to determine fertility, infertility, pregnancy, and not pregnancy. Laboratory techniques, we've looked at DNA fragmentation at fresh semen samples versus snap frozen versus slow frozen versus wet eyes versus room temperature at four hours and room temperature at 24 hours. When IVF labs say we want to try and get a fresh sample, this is why they're getting the data from makes sense, right? The fresh sample from the same patient obtained will be have the lowest amount of sperm DNA fragmentation. If they're frozen, it goes up a little higher, not that much more. When you look at it, it's actually about 12% to 30%. So it's not like all of the sperm DNA gets fragmented with the freezing process. Of course, if you leave it at room temperature for about 24 hours, then the sperm DNA fragmentation rises a lot. So yes, it is, is it good to get a fresh sample? 100%. But can we wait for 24 hours, especially with testicular sperm samples? Totally reasonable because DNA fragmentation with testicular samples, as I said, is not as much. Same way with uh, when you do uh, centrifugation as well as with IUI, if you uh, swim up samples, density gradient, density gradient, plus swim up, sperm fragmentation drops, which is why these are all techniques that are used prior to IUI, because at least the sperm that you're injecting using an IUI sample will probably be the best in terms of quality of sperm if you have good numbers. If you start off with a low number, then trying to do all of these techniques and use a lower number probably doesn't make sense. If you start with 100 million sperm count, and if you're doing an IUI sample, then using these techniques and trying and, and, and inseminating the best sperm sample makes a difference. If you're starting at 10 million, then if you do all of these wash, swim up, density gradient, you can end up with 1, 2 million, and that doesn't make so much sense with an IUI success. So what happens in sperm DNA fragmented? So basically, as you um, increase the time point in analysis, the sperm DNA fragmentation continues to rise. With frozen and thawed and 24-hour post-thaw, it also goes up. So how does DNA fragmentation predict IUI and IVF? What am I supposed to tell my patient if the DNA fragmentation is abnormal? Am I going to tell them that their IUI success is lower, their IVF success is lower or not? Two studies. Here shown that DNA fragmentation less than 27% seems to have an increased risk of increased chance of pregnancy with IUI compared to less, greater than 27%. Nothing magical about this 27%. They basically plotted all of the sperm DNA fragmentation, all of their IUI cycles, and they, they came up with a cutoff, right? All the message here is that if you inseminate a sample with a very high sperm DNA fragmentation, chance of IUI success is going to be a little lower. Same way with IVF. Does it predict uh, pregnancy with IVF? So right now there is absolutely not strong enough indication because I think somebody asked the question, can we pick up sperm that are not fragmented DNA? Right? Can we pick and choose which sperm is better, which sperm is not? We can't. When you do DNA fragmentation testing, you kill the sperm. Right? That's the first thing. You put a fluorophore, you stain the sperm, the sperm nucleus, and therefore you kill the sperm. So once you kill the sperm, you can't use it for IVF. So no, the answer is no. So you cannot pick up sperm of good quality that have good uh, sperm DNA without fragmentation. So you take a chance when you inject the sperm. But if you know that the whole semen sample has a higher DNA fragmentation, it can decrease IUI success. But with IVF, it doesn't appear to change uh, success, and so therefore it's really not indicated in the routine evaluation of male infertility. So what are some of the outcomes? So 23 papers investigated the influence of DNA damage and they looked at fertilization, embryo quality, and pregnancy, and pregnancy loss, and they found that there was some association. So sperm DNA damage was definitely associated with increased risk of pregnancy loss, so it didn't actually change the clinical pregnancy rate, 
but then the live birth rate decreased because the, the, the females could not carry on the pregnancy. So therefore, it's important to tell the couple that, listen, the chance of pregnancy is not going to change, but we don't know if you'll be able to carry the pregnancy through term or not. So then what does it depend? So it really ultimately depended on the oocyte quality. So they took uh, 210 male partners of couples undergoing IVF for the first time, and oocytes from infertile patients were employed, and DNA fragmentation had a negative impact on pregnancy. For every 10% increase in DNA fragmentation, the probability of not achieving a pregnancy increased by 1.3. However, when they used donor eggs, then the DNA fragmentation did not have a statistically significant effect. So ultimately boiled down to the pregnancy success here was dependent upon oocyte quality. It really didn't matter what the sperm DNA fragmentation was. So what can we do? So doctor, we have a patient, his DNA fragmentation, I've done it twice already. One test came back 53%, other test came back 78%. What can we do with this couple? They're planning to do IVF, they're planning to do IUI. What can we do? So what are some of the strategies? One is to use antioxidants. How long to use it for? Mm, empiric uh, for now, but usually three to six months before I either repeat DNA fragmentation or they just undergo an IVF cycle. Varicocele repair. So if the guy has a large varicocele, even if the sperm parameters are normal and they have abnormal DNA fragmentation, I use varicocele repair as an indication either prior to their IUI or their IVF cycle, right? Because now we do have data showing that in couples that undergo IVF and have decreased DNA fragmentation, then there is a decreased risk of pregnancy loss as they go on. Last strategy here is to use testicular sperm. So this is a little a relatively new two studies that came out of uh, Cornell in Brazil, published in Fertility Sterility last year, showing that in, if they have failed IVF cycle, so not de novo, not for their first IVF cycle. If they have failed IVF cycle and sperm DNA fragmentation was investigated, in the second cycle, they used testicular sperm and they showed an increased chance of pregnancy as well as live birth. So let's talk about reactive oxygen species. So most likely, I think DNA damage is key when there is excessive ROS and it's associated with DNA fragmentation and poor chromatin packing. So DNA damage by ROS, increased data, nice data to show that it decreases implantation, impairs embryonic development, increases miscarriage. So when somebody fails an IVF cycle, one of the first questions that you want to ask is why did they fail? Right? If it's lack of fertilization, meaning the, 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 the egg did not fertilize, the sperm did not fertilize, then it's most likely not a sperm issue. Right? It's most likely not a sperm DNA fragmentation issue. However, when they tell you, oh doc, we had eight eggs, or sorry, let's start with 16 eggs, we were able to get five embryos go to day three, and not even one made it to day five, then you know there's likely a sperm issue, okay? So that's a good time to think that, oh, maybe sperm DNA fragmentation is an issue. Or we had four embryos, great quality, we transferred two, nothing happened, frozen embryo transfer, second cycle, nothing happened, implantation failure, right? Again, a time to either think that sperm could be an issue and sperm DNA fragmentation could be an issue. Or they got pregnant, biochemical pregnancy, six weeks, eight weeks, they lost the pregnancy, right? Again, to think sperm is an issue. So sperm is most likely not an issue when it's fertilization defect. But any time after that along the way, if they fail the IVF cycle, then they think about sperm being an issue, and that's when you should intervene when the sperm DNA fragmentation is high. So antioxidants, so the ideal antioxidant, we have a talk later on on this, so I won't stress this, but it needs to reach high concentrations in the seminal plasma, and it needs to have the ability to scavenge some of the uh, uh, oxidants. So some of the ingredients we'll talk about here, CoQ10, L-carnitine, zinc, and selenium. Second strategy, so if the guy has a large varicocele, normal sperm count, and has increased DNA fragmentation, very nice data actually to show that varicocelectomy can actually change in history, in patients who've had miscarriages, like this couple, right? They lost two pregnancies, one at six weeks, one at eight weeks, have high DNA fragmentation. Then if they have a large varicocele, certainly to go ahead and fix it. Because there's very good data to show that varicocele will improve DNA fragmentation. Not so good data where it translates into that. Does that DNA fragmentation actually change pregnancy rate? Not so good. So very good data to show the increased DNA fragmentation can improve pregnancy success. Right, or decrease pregnancy success. That many studies have shown on that. Very good data to show that varicocelectomy can decrease DNA fragmentation. With all of this put together, no one has the time to do that study. So this is the study that I was talking about from uh, Brazil as well as Cornell. Prospective study, observational, in which they used testicular sperm compared to ejaculated sperm. 
The first panel here is uh, testicular sperm, second column here is ejaculated sperm and the p-value. When you look at it, miscarriage rate was lower as the live birth rate was higher with the used testicular sperm compared to ejaculated sperm. So again, they all fail the first cycle, right? They fail the first cycle, but when you remember, we changed something on our end in the male factor side where we used testicular sperm, but what was not accounted for in the study is that they must have changed something in the female as well, right? Change in media, change in oocyte activation, change in hormonal stimulation, change in protocols, right? Something must have happened. So just to say that, oh my gosh, we used testicular sperm and our pregnancy success improved, probably not true. They must have changed something in the female factor which is not reported at all. This is a study that we did with using sperm fish. I think with the advent of PGS these days, so routinely employed, we're probably most likely not going to use fish anymore in isolation. So in this couple, normal semen analysis, lost pregnancy twice, I think testing DNA fragmentation is totally reasonable. Uh, try, if, they have, if the guy has a varicocele to fix the varicocele, totally reasonable. If he has uh, varicocele and DNA fragmentation, to start him empirically on antioxidant therapy for three to six months, all totally reasonable. So his sperm DNA fragmentation was 65% on sperm chromatin um, assay. Normal in that lab was less than 32%. In exam, he had a large grade three varicocele, like I showed in the first case. They're planning to do IVF. What are some of the options? Right? This is the discussion that you want to have, and these are all things that you want to think about. So in conclusion, I think we all know that infertile men have increased sperm DNA fragmentation compared to fertile men. Right? Sperm of infertile men are certainly more susceptible to reactive oxygen species and they have, could have increased ROS. That is one of the explanations for why they could have increased DNA fragmentation. Sperm with damaged DNA can successfully fertilize because many uh, de novo mutations in the offspring are because of changes in the oocyte quality and it's not because of sperm DNA fragmentation. And extensive sperm DNA fragmentation cannot be over overcome by oocytes, and so therefore you, as a male factor specialist, should employ some strategies such as antioxidants, varicocele repair, or bypass the whole epididymis and try and get testicular sperm on their second cycle. Thanks.